The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. If you haven't read him, you've probably watched his work on the big or small screen. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight on The Agenda in the Summer, novelist and screenwriter Tom Parada on his new book and bringing his characters to life in a changing political and cultural landscape. He's a best-selling novelist and has been called an American Chekhov. He's also won the Peabody, is a screenwriter, and his works have been nominated for Academy Awards. Tom Parada's new book is called Tracy Flick Can't Win. It returns to the character played in 1999 by Reese Witherspoon in the novel-turned-film Election to find out how she and the times have changed. And Tom Parada joins us now from Belmont, Massachusetts. Welcome. Hi. Hi, well, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed, I, I really enjoyed this book. Um, you have now written 10 novels and five screenplays. Uh, what's it like to create characters and plot lines and to actually get to see them played out on a larger screen? You know, it, it can be a, a, a real thrill. I mean, uh, I've been so lucky to have uh, actors of the caliber of, you know, Reese Witherspoon who made uh, Tracy Flick into an immortal character. Um, Carrie Coon w uh, played Nora Durst in The Leftovers. Kate Winslet in Little Children. Uh, Catherine Hahn with Mrs. Fletcher. Just, uh, to see these actors kind of bring, uh, you know, an imaginary character of mine to life on screen has been, uh, you know, just an unvarnished thrill. I, I, the one, it's not even a drawback, but once they do it, it's hard for me to remember what those characters were like in in my own mind. Well, um, they, I they became that character. I was I was about to ask you that too because um, I was wondering, does it turn out the way you wanted to, or vastly different uh, from what was going on in your head when you were writing those books? Well, you know there are often differences, but um, for the most part, th those are kind of exciting. Uh, you have to be open whenever you collaborate to let the let your collaborator um, bring what they can bring. And it's often something that you wouldn't have expected. And, and I think to be open to that um, and to you know let that happen and not be defensive or protective of your characters can be really useful. I can only imagine the amount of collaboration that goes on behind the scenes. Um, Election was a two-hour film, and The Leftovers, that ended up being a 28-episode. Um, what was that experience like for you? That was one of the great experiences of my life, actually. Um, so, you know, I wrote this novel, and I brought it to HBO, and I, I knew that I didn't know enough about TV um, to run the show myself at that point. And, we brought in uh, the showrunner Damon Lindelof, who had made Lost, and he, to me, Damon is possibly the greatest uh, TV writer around, and um, somebody who approaches storytelling from a very different standpoint than I do. He's a kind of a science fiction comic book uh, person, and I'm a psychological realist, and I think. Um, Often he just surprised me, you know, he just wanted to bring a, a level of boldness and magic into the show that initially made me uncomfortable. But um, as we went on and I saw the possibilities that he was uh, creating space for, I was just really um, excited about that. You just called yourself a psychological realist. How would you define that? Um, you know, I start with characters and I try to get inside of those characters and um, let their thoughts and desires um, dictate the progress of the story. And, and um, so, you know, I, I don't, I mean, The Leftovers started with a very high concept, a kind of a speculative concept, which was there's a kind of a rapture-like event. But instead of really digging into all the details of this event where millions of people disappear, I set the story three years later. And 
just tried to deal with like the psychological fallout for my characters. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I, my literary uh, heroes are, you know, writers like um, John Cheever and, and Philip Roth and Willa Cather. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really writing, it, it, Chekhov is a, is a hero of mine as well. Um, so I'm just writing, you know, about ordinary people and their struggles and their dilemmas and their desires, um, rather than approaching storytelling from um, a more plot-driven uh, perspective. With this book, what made you want to revive the character of Tracy Flick? Um, you know, Tracy has stayed alive, um, in, particularly in, in the U.S., as a kind of touchstone character, someone who embodies a kind of um, unapologetic female ambition. And, and for a long time after the movie was made um, in 1999, she was seen as a kind of villain or at least an unpleasant archetype, which I wasn't really that happy about. And I was really happy to see in about the past 10 years, a kind of revision of Tracy, people realizing, you know, that uh, she was treated unfairly, that she was an ambitious woman and that ambitious women are held to very different standards than ambitious men. And, and so she was in my head because she was part of a um, cultural conversation. Um, and then I started to write a book about a football hero who comes back to uh, his hometown to be honored, but he has had um, some a, a brain injury, as many professional football players have. And it was sort of about a reckoning that he has with his past. And as I wrote the book, I, I kept kind of wanting to write it in the style of election, which has this uh, oral history kind of set up with a bunch of different people passing the baton and telling the story in, in fragments. And I thought, why am I writing this like it's election? And, and I suddenly sensed, oh, is Tracy in this school? I feel like Tracy wants to be part of this story because, uh, you know, throughout election and then Tracy Flick can't win, her nemesis is always the sort of football hero, the golden boy who gets unfair advantages while she has to work and scrape for every little thing. Well, you mentioned Vito. We're going to come back to him in just a minute. But I want to remind people of uh, election. We have a short clip to show. Sheldon, please roll. And I also think that certain young and naive people need to thank their lucky stars and be very, very grateful that the entire school didn't find out about certain indiscretions that could have ruined their reputations and their chances to win certain elections. And I think certain older people, like you and your colleague, shouldn't be leching after their students, especially when some of them can't even get their own wives pregnant. And they certainly shouldn't be making slanderous accusations, especially when certain young, naive people's mothers are paralegal secretaries at the city's biggest law firm and have won many successful lawsuits. And if you want to keep questioning me like this, I won't continue without my attorney present. Reese is amazing. Um, this was the late 1990s when the novel and the film came out and when we first met uh, Tracy Flick. I Hopefully I'm not overstating the obvious, but uh, was this inspired by Hillary Clinton? You know, it's very much a Clinton-era work. Um, I started writing election in the early 90s, right after the 1992 election when Bill Clinton became president, and I was extremely interested in um, what was then called the character question, this idea that people's private lives um, were the key to how they would uh, act as politicians. So if you lied to your wife, you would lie to the public was the sort of um, shorthand for something like this. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was a big change in the way that politicians were treated in America. Like John F. Kennedy had a crazy private life, but it was hidden from public view uh, by, you know, journalists uh, conspired to, to keep it uh, hidden. And then with Clinton, of course, his private life was his undoing. Um, but I think Tracy also was in some sense, um, uh, you know, definitely embodied a certain kind of feminism of that moment, this, this moment when suddenly, you know, girls who'd been raised with feminist moms were feeling like, they could do anything and perhaps become president uh, themselves. And, you know, Hillary loomed 
over that, right? She was a different kind of first lady and she was trying to get involved in policy. And of course she eventually came as close as you could possibly come to becoming our first woman president. And so Tracy is a kind of a, um, a character inspired by the Clinton era, which I would argue lasted, you know, a good, uh, you know, you could argue that it's still going on, that Trump was a reaction to to the Clintons. And, and you know, I think Tracy continues to be relevant because she is um, on a kind of parallel course as a, someone like Hillary Clinton. Well, speaking of being president, um, in the book, this is what you write, what Tracy's feeling. Being president was my ambition, not my dream. There's a difference. And it wasn't a crazy ambition. Whatever it is that a person needs to reach a goal like that, I had it in me. I knew I did. Even back in high school, especially then, I was smart. I was tough. I had an incredible capacity for hard work. And I believed in myself. No imposter syndrome for me. And beyond that was my actual superpower, which was that I wanted it more than anyone else. Trust me, you didn't want to get in my way. You mentioned female ambition earlier. Um, has the way we view female ambition changed? You know, uh, I, I think it has in many ways, right? When I started writing election in the early 90s, there were very few women politicians in America. And now there are, you know, there are quite a few. And, uh, you know, I, I think within the next 10 years, we may see our first um, woman president. But on the other hand, you saw with Hillary, there were just people who said, I don't like her. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and they, it wasn't just that they didn't like her. It was, I think they felt very threatened by her. There was some level of unexamined, uh, hostility in them. But I do think that um, women are held to different standards, that their ambition is still uh, a little threatening to people who grew up in a world w that was where men seem to have some natural right to be at the top of the hierarchy. And I, I would also argue, too, that I think w women themselves, because um, when you said that earlier on about how people responded to election, um, I think there was a lot of young women, uh, myself included, who might have been, a, were a little bit uncomfortable with that. Obviously, as you get older, you look back and you say, the conditioning that you're in, the world that you're in, is telling you different things, um, which is really great to see you revisit Tracy, um, because at the end of uh, election, we see Tracy some years later working as a congressional aide in Washington. But Tracy didn't end up becoming um, president, far from it. Now in this book, she's in her mid forties. Um, what's happened to Tracy Flick since we last saw her? Yeah, you know, it, it was funny. For a long time, I would have discussions with people like, "What would Tracy be doing?" And some people would go, "She's going to be, you know, running for president as a Republican, or she um, would be uh, one of these talking heads on Fox News, you know, kind of a Laura Ingram type." And um, you know, I, I actually had this sense that. Every high school, there's a there's a Tracy Flick, and not every Tracy goes on to some, you know, fame and fortune and, and great success. And um, you know, Tracy lives a precarious life. Her, she has, is raised by a single mom. They don't have a lot of money. Um, their relationship is very um, exclusive. It's just the two of them against the world. And when Tracy's in law school in the new book, her mom gets gets sick, and she decides to come home. And care for her, you know, like a lot of women, she feels like um, this is something that she has to do, and and she she wants to do it. She doesn't begrudge her mother, but for you know, because of this misfortune that is both um, you know a medical misfortune, but also uh, an economic misfortune, she's sort of thrown off of her trajectory toward the top and has to kind of cobble together. A life first as a substitute substitute teacher, and then she goes to grad school and gets a PhD in education administration, and she's a um, an assistant principal at a high school. So by any means, you know, a, a highly educated, successful person, but the stakes are, in her mind, very small compared to the arena that she wanted to play in, which was Washington. DC and electoral politics. And so um, she feels like a lot of us, you know, a lot of people in middle age, like a little bit diminished and that there's this um, 
somewhat embarrassing or demoralizing gap between what she hoped for and, and what she has. It's also very interesting to see the relationship she has with her daughter, because now she's also a mother. Um, I want to read something else that you write in the book. Um, you write, you can't keep reading these stories one after the other, all these high-achieving young women exploited by teachers and mentors and bosses, and keep clinging to the idea that your own case was unique. In fact, it had become pretty clear to me that that was how it worked. You got tricked into feeling more exceptional than you actually were, like the normal rules no longer applied. And of course, this is Tracy, um, which brings me to hashtag me too. Um, how did Tracy's views on her high school affair with a teacher change over the years? Yeah, so so this was a, a big reason for me wanting to revisit uh, Tracy Flick. You know, when I wrote that story in the early '90s, uh, Tracy, the Tracy's backstory, she had an affair with an affair um, that was that's she says that's the wrong word but that's the word I use um, she had a sexual relationship with one of her teachers and at, at age 15 and something that now I think we'd all look at and just say that's that's a terrible thing but she um, in the book said you know felt that it was a choice that she made it was something she wanted to do uh, if, Eventually, or actually pretty quickly, she realized that she didn't want a sexual relationship with this teacher, and she stopped it. And the teacher was uh, caught and fired. And um, it's a it's a big part of the backstory of the movie Election. And Tracy's defiant in that book and movie. She's you know I'm not a victim. I did what I wanted. He was a big baby. You know she has she has a lot of different ways of articulating this. Um, but when Me Too happened, I started to see a lot of stories of women um, looking back and saying, you know, I had this relationship with an older man. It felt consensual at the time. Um, but looking back now, I realized that I was maybe taken advantage of. And, and I was very curious to see, you know, how Tracy would look back on that experience as a high school administrator, as a mother, um, and as someone living in a time that has a very different language for discussing, um, you know, uh, sex uh, that takes place within an unequal power relationship, like a teacher-student. You also empower Tracy Flick. She is the architect of her own decisions, the decision, as you mentioned earlier, to look after her mother, to become a single mother, her career and relationship choices. Um, did you want us to like her this time around? You know, <laughs> um, I I think that uh, I, I never want that to be the goal with with um, characters. Uh, my goal is always to understand them and let them speak for themselves. And and you know I like Tracy even in election though I was uh, startled by how many people saw her as a kind of a villain. Part of it I think is in the movie she's played with maybe. You know, very funny hard edges by Reese Witherspoon in the movie is a little bit um, harder edged and more satirical in, in tone than the book. But yes, I do think there's something poignant about Tracy um, in Tracy Flick Can't Win. Um, you know, when, when we're young, we're full of potential and we measure ourselves against our potential. And when we're middle aged, we have to measure ourselves by what we are in this moment. And I think um, Tracy is struggling the way a lot of middle-aged people do with how to define success. Um, do I define success by the good I'm doing in the world now, or do I define it by a teenage dream that um, I haven't been able to realize? One of the characters, uh, Vito, is also dealing with this. Um, you wrote this novel and Mrs. Fletcher with female protagonist. But in these and other novels, you, all, you explore male behavior through football culture, pornography, gender violence, bullying. What have you figured out about this side of masculinity? Well, you know, I think it's easy to get frustrated with the pace of, of change. But I do think a huge amount has changed in gender relationships and in our sense of, um, you know, who deserves power and, and um, you know, all those things. And, and I think there just has been, along with, you know, the kind of gradual empowerment of women, I think a real 
um, re-examination of um, what's wrong with masculinity. Um, and it's something I've been um, interested in my entire uh, writing life. You know, I went, I grew up in a very um, traditional working class culture and then went uh, to college at Yale and, and you know, really had to re-examine a lot of the um, values and behaviors that I was was raised with. And, and it's been interesting to, to see, you know, I think my own kids just grew up in a whole different world in terms of how they think about these things. Um, but I, I, you know, hierarchies are, you know, to find yourself at the top of a hierarchy just because of an accident of, of birth um, I, is, is often uh, morally <laughs> damaging to people. <laughs> you know, they, they think they, you know, you look at someone like Trump who's on the top of every hierarchy you can imagine and he, you know, he honestly thinks he can get away with anything and the world often uh, seems to agree with him. And, you know, there's someone like Tracy who feels herself you know, always on the bottom or, or at least, you know, fighting against the tide. And, uh, you know, she has to fight for every little scrap that, that she ever gets, you know, and, and there is a kind of inherent injustice in that, that I think, um, you know, is, is, is I, I, I think society is, is fighting against it. Uh, some of us are fighting against it. And I, and, um, I think that's a great thing, but it is, uh, you know, it's exhausting <laughs> for someone like Tracy. Well, uh, speaking of Tracy, I'm not sure if uh, you've this has been sold for the big screen, but will we see Reese um, Witherspoon reviving that role as Tracy Flick? I, I sure hope so. Um, there are some conversations going on about that. Nothing has um, been finalized yet, but it would be so exciting to see uh, her return to this character in, in middle age, I think uh, it would just be, um, I, I would be so excited to see what she would make of, um, you know, Tracy, who's an assistant principal in high school, um, you know, still struggling to kind of make baby steps toward the top. With a clock ticking as well. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, it's been such an, a pleasure to speak with you. As I shared with you before we started taping, we didn't want to give away too much of the book, but at the very end, I was in tears, in tears. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with uh, us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Nam. I, I really appreciated the uh, conversation. Hamilton has a long, rich history, but some of that city's trees predates its founding by a considerable amount. Justin Chandler is here to tell us about that. He's our Ontario Hubs journalist covering the Hamilton and Niagara region. Welcome. Hey, Joanne. All right, so you spoke to a landscape architect who is documenting trees in Hamilton. Her project is called Monuments. Walk me through that idea behind the whole project. All right, so Lesha McCricky, she's an artist, she's a landscape architect, and her project, she's attempting to find and catalog all the trees in Hamilton that are older than the founding of the city, so older than 150 years old. So this has involved uh, crowdsourcing, finding the locations of about 1,200 trees, and uh, going and actually measuring them to figure out the age. And there's also going to be an, an arts component with uh, photography, uh, creating a map so that people will actually know where they are. So it's, it's a pretty comprehensive project. All right, so I've seen some big trees, but these are some pretty, pretty big trees. Uh, I want to pull up a photo. Here is Lesha in front of one of the oldest trees in Hamilton. Tell us about this bur oak tree. Yeah, so this tree here, uh, 300 years old is the estimate. So if people go to the Huntington Park Recreation Center in Hamilton, um, they'll see these out in the field. Uh, and there's just a, a really interesting pocket of old trees in a space that you might not expect. I want to actually pull up another photo. Uh, this is a very large northern red oak here. And you were just talking about sort of the measurements and how they determine it. Why is the, the, the way that she does it different from what I sort of understand when you sort of determine the age is sort of looking at the rings of the inside mm. of the tree, correct? Yeah, so the, like the scientific way to 100% to know the age is you take a core sample, you're looking at the rings. Um, she's not doing an invasive measurement, so the way that she does it, she takes the tape measure, wraps that around the tree, 
and then she uh, figures out the circumference. So she divides the, um, the circumference by pi, and then she multiplies this by the growth factor. And the growth factor is different for every tree in different regions. So for example, for the bur oak, it was six. And that gives you the estimate for the tree's age. And if people are curious about that formula, that's in the article on our website. I was gonna say, a lot of math there. All yeah. right, so in your article, you wrote, if trees are older than the city, that also means their context is inherently indigenous. How does that play into your understanding of Hamilton's trees? Yeah, so this was something interesting that Lesha was telling me. Um, she worked with uh, Paul General, who was the former Eco Center Director at Six Nations while she was working on this, and they sort of discussed this idea of monuments. Um, and they were thinking about how a lot of our monuments today, they're to our colonial history. Um, these are coming down. These are things that a lot of people are distancing themselves from now. Um, but trees are sort of this uh, living monument um, that have been around since you know the time before uh, European contact uh, in the region when some 80% of the land was covered by forest, and now we're down to some 20%. So it's just this idea that, you know, this is a, a monument to our living history um, is really what she was trying to express. Now, we know it's not just planting trees that help the environment, but it's how they are positioned and grouped. I found this very interesting in your article. What did Lesha tell you about that? Yeah, her thinking is that a lot of the time when we think about tree canopy, it's like, okay, we're going to plant a bunch of trees along a boulevard in the middle of the road, or we're going to plant them along the side. Um, her theory is that we should be planting more trees in these pockets where we know that there's really old, successful trees. She's thinking, you know, if we just plant a tree on a boulevard, who's to say the soil's very good? Who's to say it's going to get a lot of water? But if we look and say, oh, well, this this area of land is sustaining several 200-year-old trees, this would actually be a great place to put more. And so her feeling is that we should maybe try and emphasize those areas more in our tree planting uh, rather than some of the other things that we're currently doing. I also found this very interesting. She said that the, the trees talk. Correct? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, there's some, some research. Um, I can't say I'm too familiar with it, but about how trees can share nutrients um, and information with one another. And so that when trees are together, they're not so much competing for light, but they're helping one another. So it's sort of this idea that uh, trees are connected and, and actually do well when they're with one another. Very interesting stuff. Justin, thank you so much. Thank you. And that is tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I am Jan Jagnaldin. Thanks for watching TBO and for joining us online at tbo.org. Monday, as part of our partnership with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario during their annual 2022 conference, Nam Kiwanuka checks in on the relationship between cities and the province. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TBO's journalism. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.